Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much for bringing each one of us here this morning. Uh, we thank you for the grace and mercy in our lives um, that uh, you have called us uh, to be part of this Bible study. Uh, we thank you so much for your words to us this morning in these two Psalms that Tracy's going to expound on. Um, thank you for Tracy and for um, the ways in which uh, you worked in her own life through these Psalms and uh, the words that she's going to bring to us this morning. Uh, Lord, we're so thankful for your word and for um, just the example of David crying out to you in his weakness um, and how you met him right where he was. So um, be with Tracy now as she brings us your word and help our hearts to be soft and teachable and um, and just learn what you want us to hear today. So thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. So we are going to be focusing um, exclusively on two different Psalms today, um, 34 and 56. And I am thrilled to be able to um, do this because I love the Psalms. I live in the Psalms. And um, so I'm very excited to be able to, to be teaching this week. So we're going to hone in on David's thoughts and feelings as he's going through the events of 1 Samuel 21 uh, that Carrie taught on last week. So just as a quick review to set the scene, chapter 21 describes David fleeing for his life from Saul and going to Elimelech the priest for food and weapons. And then he flees to Gath where he's captured by the Philistines and escapes by pretending to be insane in front of the king. So let's look at some of his emotions from this time that come out in these Psalms. Okay. We see desperation, we see hopelessness, we see fear. So you can imagine with a powerful king and his huge armies chasing after you that it would be hard to find a place to hide. I'm sure he felt really alone and hopeless for a good outcome. We're not sure why David decided to flee towards his enemies. Um, he went to Gath, which was um, a city of the Philistines, um, but it seems it may have involved a lapse of faith on his part. God had gotten him out of some pretty tight situations in the past, but here he kind of decided to take things into his own hands and um, be creative, really. <laughs> so he must have been pretty scared and pretty shaken to do that. But if the king is against you, who in the right mind would want to be for you? Even with the prince Jonathan on his side out in the wilderness, he was pretty much on his own. He had no place to live. He had no food. He had no weapons. Most of us have not had to deal with this level of fear and desperation. Although I was thinking of our Afghan friends um, and how they could really relate to this. Our churches befriended and helped take care of two of them. And um, when the Taliban took over last summer, they had to just grab a few belongings and flee for their lives. They were able to get out but there's many others that still remain there and are daily living with fear and hunger. So as we go through this with David, let's just remember to pray for them, the people that remain in Afghanistan, as well as the ones that are here and trying to start a whole new life. And also speaking of fear, as John and I shared about this Sunday, the country of Ukraine awaits in fear to see if Russia is gonna attack and try to take over. Uh, we lived and worked in Ukraine for many years as missionaries. And I remember vividly in 2014, eight years ago, uh, when Russia first invaded the Southern and Eastern parts of the country, the stress level was so high and the uncertainty was just overwhelming. At one point we had to evacuate from Kyiv when there were Russian troops on the Northern border two hours from where we lived. And um, our family and our teammates got in our cars and just headed West. 
And we had no idea if we'd even be able to get out of the city. And our friends there are once again living in this kind of fear. They have bags packed by the door with cash and passports just ready to go at a moment's notice. Just constantly wondering if they should flee and when they should flee. Um, so many unknowns and so much fear. But a lot of them are actually more worried about the effects of this turmoil and how it's gonna affect the economy. And um, if it's gonna get worse than it already is. And they're fearful for their freedom of worship, for their children's futures, in addition to their homes and their personal safety if Russia invades. So our fears here in suburban Philly may be different, but they're just as real to us. What were our first thoughts as we woke up this morning? Do all of our what ifs keep us in an intense control mode? And has the pandemic with all of its looming possibilities unhinged us? Praise God that he's given us the gift of the Psalms to show us that even the most faith-filled hearts can be fearful and that there is a path out of fear. A little aside to start, I think all of us at one time or another have struggled with the Psalms. Um, they can sometimes seem overly dramatic or even blasphemous at times. Some of us don't like emotions in general and would rather stuff them um, or ignore them than lay them out on the table like David does. Um, it can really make us uncomfortable, but for some reason, God has decided to have this a part of his holy word. So here's some challenging questions that we're going to discuss. What if emotional regurgitation is part of God's prescription for help and healing? And what if whining and complaining to God actually deepens our relationship with him? What if he longs for that kind of relationship with us? What if it was actually even somehow a sign of faith? So let's dive in. We're going to start with Psalm 56 because that's actually first chronologically. We know this because it says in the heading, when the Philistines seized him in Gath, which was before he pretended to be insane, mentioned in the heading of Psalm 34. So while we're on the topic of headings, in case you are wondering why it says, according to the dove on far off terebinth, a terebinth was a deciduous tree that grows in the Mediterranean region. And this was probably the name of a melody that this song was sung to. I am not, however, familiar with this tune, and just to be clear, will not be singing it to you today. <laughs> so let's read the first few verses of Psalm 56. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? So it's a prayer, as many of the Psalms are. But he goes back and forth between talking to God and talking to himself. He starts out his conversation with God begging and dumping. He says, be gracious to me, O God. He begs for grace and mercy and help, even though he may have made a mistake going to Gath. He's not afraid to ask big and bold. He's familiar with the fact that God is merciful. He knows him well. He whines about his circumstances. He confesses that he's afraid. Even bold, courageous David, who killed lions, bears, and giants with his uh, single-handedly, he's afraid. And David, that has slain his ten thousands, he's fearful. He goes on to say, all day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as, as they have waited for my life. He's not just afraid of Saul, obviously, but of the Philistines whom he greatly offended by killing their giant and by leading armies against them. They're also after him. But here's some more examples of complaining and dumping from scripture. From Psalm 109. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. I fade away like an evening shadow. I am shaken off like a locust. 
My knees give way from fasting. My body is thin and gaunt. I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they shake their heads. That is some raw stuff. And in God's word. And then from Psalm 88. For my soul is full of trouble and my life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. Sounds a lot like depression and grieving, doesn't it? From Psalm 142, it says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I told my trouble. And then even from Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. There's something therapeutic about dumping. We do it all the time with our friends and family. We often even enjoy, enjoy the exaggerated piling up of how rough things are for us. And it's important for us to process and to feel our emotions. God can use that to bring healing. But do we also feel comfortable taking our dump truck to God? The difference here is that David is not just complaining in general, He's bringing his complaints directly to God. Our prayers sometimes can be too formal, like the way you would explain your problems to your boss or a neighbor you just met, as opposed to a, your best friend. Do you see the difference between, dear Lord, please heal my mother, and oh Lord, I'm scared of what will happen. I don't know what I would do without her. You know we need her. Please have mercy and heal her. You are powerful and good, and I'm asking for you to intervene. It's making yourself vulnerable. It's assuming a close relationship where you have the right to talk like that. It's bringing all of your weakness and need and fears to a heavenly father whose chest is big enough to pound on and who has the power to do something about it. It's not just wallowing in self-pity or sitting in anger and bitterness. If we don't bring our concerns to God, that's where we can end up. The direction we fling our complaints is important. After all, we know he hates injustice, sickness, and brokenness more than we do. And he says in his word that he wants us to bring our fears to him, like in Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. When we come to him with our complaints and fears, it's actually a small step of faith. We have to acknowledge first that he even exists. Secondly, we have to believe that he hears us. And thirdly, that he cares about our problems. We come to him because we know he's good and just and merciful and powerful. So we're admitting all of that by even just turning to him. It's actually somehow ironically an act of worship. We're choosing to come to him, showing some trust just by even showing up at his doorstep. We see many stories in scripture where God actually is moved by faith and responds to faith. Think of all the miracles that Jesus did when someone demonstrated their faith in him. If you struggle with words or knowing how to do this, use the Psalms to help guide your feelings into prayers. They can be an amazing resource when we feel like we can't even pray. In addition to begging and dumping, David also does a lot of talking to himself in these Psalms. John Piper says, learn to talk to yourself more than you listen to yourself. This sounds like good advice, knowing the kinds of things that our inner self can say. David reminds himself in verse three, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. It's more like he's saying, I should put my trust in you. It's really hard, but I know that that's what would help me. I need to remember to turn to you, God, when I'm full of fear. 
it's also a beautiful little verse to teach to our kids. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. There's at least one song that I know of that comes from that. So down in verse nine, he's talking to himself again. This I know that God is for me. This is something we're quick to forget or at least act like we've forgotten. We feel like maybe God is not on our team when things are not going well in our lives. But the ultimate answer to that question cannot be ascertained anywhere but the foot of the cross. God choosing to sacrifice his son on our behalf should clear up any doubts about his loyalty and that he is for us. In verse 11, David reminds himself again, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Again, trying to convince himself and remind himself. In verse 12, I must perform my vows to you. Oh God, I will render thank offerings to you. He's determined to turn it around and be strong. But this is a kind of strength that requires weakness and humility. Being thankful and, to, and submissive to God's plan. And then it says three times in this chapter, in God whose word I praise, the rock of God's word. He's reminding himself of this rock that he needs to rest on. So the interesting thing is that it seems from this psalm that the path out of fear and despair involves thank offerings and worship, which leads us right to Psalm 34. I'll read verses one through seven. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes us boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. This is David's song of thanks to God after God's provision of bread and a sword and after his narrow escape from the Philistines. So if trusting God with our complaints is a step of faith, then worshiping in the midst of suffering is a further step, a challenging step. But I love his pure heart here. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't hold a grudge for the fact that he's still fleeing for his life or that he was even in this difficult place to begin with. His shame for not trusting God doesn't get in the way. He wholeheartedly blesses, boasts in, magnifies, and exalts the Lord. He testifies how the Lord answers his, answered his cries and delivered him not only from captivity, but from his fears as well. He's fully convinced of God's interventions and wants everyone to know what kind of amazing God he has. And he wants everyone to join him in praise. There's something important about corporate worship, about singing to each other of God's greatness. The reason that David is able to worship despite his circumstances is that his praise doesn't spring from what's happening in his life. It springs from the unchanging truths of who God is, that solid rock. Yes, God answering his prayer is reason to rejoice, but it serves to remind him of who God is and what he's like. God is for him. God is with him. He is strong. He is good. Those things don't change no matter what is happening. Recently on a Sunday morning, I was really struggling and the church body stood around me singing, but I almost felt if I joined in that it would somehow be insincere it wouldn't be real, that I would have to ignore the hard stuff or pretend it didn't exist if I were going to worship. But as I looked to God in my heart, he showed me that it was more a rising above on a parallel track. The struggle is here. The worship is here. And it's not one or the other. It's together at the same time. They coexist. Worship is based on God's character and not how well things are going for us or how happy we are. Worship is a posture of letting go, of blind dependence, of opening our fists, 
and acknowledging that God is overall and in all. It's like, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense, God, but I know you're good. I know you're in this and I trust you. It's being in a position of awe at his feet rather than judge over him. William Temple was an archbishop in the Church of England, and he wrote this beautiful description of worship. He said, worship is the, the submission of all our nature to God. It's the quickening of conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose. And all of this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable, and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness, which our original sin and the source of all actual sin. Charles Spurgeon describes the first half of Psalm 34 like a hymn of praise and the second half like a sermon. So the practical things that take us from complaint to worship are listed out in Psalm 34. The first discussion question for, for today asks you to underline the ways that David engages with the Lord. So if you look at all those verbs, it gives you some guidance. He says he blesses God, he boasts in him, he calls to him, he fears him or reveres him. And in verses eight to 14, he calls his readers to taste and see that the Lord is good and to take refuge in God, to be careful with our words and to do good and to seek and pursue peace. All these things are steps in the path out of fear and out of complaint and towards worship. I would boil all that down to this, getting to know God, what God is like through his word and by spending time interacting with him in prayer leads us to be in awe of him. And then in the process, we become more like him and we do good and we pursue peace. So in addition to David begging, dumping and worshiping, he also gives us a glimpse into God's response to all of this. In Psalm 56, there's one beautiful verse that sums it up, verse eight. You have kept count of my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? God has seen David in all of his days in the wilderness running for his life. He's seen his struggles and kept count of them in a book. He sees us. He knows all of our wanderings and he doesn't forget them. He so tenderly collects our tears and is heartbroken over every single one of them. He's aware of every single one of them. He sees, he understands, and he acknowledges our pain. We saw this in Jesus' compassion with the people he interacted with. He even wept with Mary and Martha to acknowledge their pain of the loss of their brother before he brought him back to life. There's something important in that, in the character of God. This is what our God is like. In chapter 34, verses 15 to 18, it says, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. When we cry out to God in prayer, he sees us, he hears us, he's attentive to us, and he's near us. What a wonderful thing to be assured of. Often, even though a friend can't help our situation, we feel better just because they heard us, because they saw what we're dealing with and acknowledged our pain and just sat with us for a while. That is what our Heavenly Father offers us at any given moment. He also desires to deliver and save us, and he actually already has. The last part of both chapters points us to Jesus and the gospel. In 56, 12 to 13, it says, I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. God did that in the moment for David, 
but he did it for us as well. It's a promise that lasts for eternity. Our souls will not die. They will live forever and they will walk in the light of life. Not sure exactly what that means, but it sounds a lot like what we know of heaven, doesn't it? In 34, 19 to 22, it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So we're not being promised here that we will be delivered from all of our afflictions or that we will never have a broken bone. I know this well, I was just in the ER on Saturday with my husband who had multiple fractures in his hand. No, we will always have afflictions as long as we live in this broken world. And yes, God does sometimes choose to deliver us for his glory, but the better news is in the bigger picture. The no broken bones is actually pointing to Jesus when he died on the cross. The soldiers broke the legs of the other two men on the other crosses next to Jesus, but they did not break Jesus' legs because he had already died. This fulfilled three Old Testament prophecies, including this one in verse 20. In Exodus 12 and Numbers 9, where the Passover is described, it says not to break the bones of the sacrificial lamb. So this is pointing us to the capital D deliverance of our capital A afflictions. Commentator Kirkpatrick says, the promise to the righteous man found an unexpectedly literal realization in the passion of the perfectly righteous one. Jesus' death on the cross broke the power of sin and death over us and secured for us an eternal future with no despair, no fear, no broken bones, and no tears that need to be collected. If we take refuge in Jesus, as it says in verse 22, admitting that we are a mess and in need of saving and believe that he is God and that he conquered sin and death, then we never will be condemned and we will be delivered. In the meantime, in the now and not yet period that we're living in, we must wait on the Lord with much endurance. Our, del our deliverance now is through the Holy Spirit. God can redeem our daily battle with fear and despair when we cry out to the living God and when we worship him. He meets us with himself, which is better than any other answer to prayer. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I'll end with this quote from Charles Spurgeon. Make a trial, an inward experimental trial of the goodness of God. You cannot see except by tasting for yourself, but if you taste, you shall see. Faith is the soul's taste. They who test the Lord by their confidence always find him good, and they become themselves blessed. Amen to that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of your goodness and your faithfulness, your loyalty to us, your power over sin and death, and we praise you. We thank you for your deliverance of us. We thank you for the grace that you give us every day. We thank you that you love to hear our complaints, that you love to have us come into your presence. We, we give you glory for that, and we thank you so much. And we pray that you would help us to turn to you and to find the grace that we need in you. We pray that you would bless our time of discussion now, that it would be to your glory. And we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.